Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm the sort of warm-up act and uh, just reporting that John Simpson has been in the taxi from Oxford Station for three minutes now. So he should not be
or something like that. Um, the reason, nah, nobody cares really, do they? But I've got a new program which um, w w is, uh, goes out on Wednesday nights. It's called Unspun World. And um, we're, we're still kind of finding our way with it to try to, uh, you know, how, how late we can edit, of course, uh, always how late everything is, not how early, um, and uh, how many people we should interview on it. It's a, it's a, a program about, um, uh, just about current affairs, but it's, uh, it's based entirely on, on BBC people. It, Piss, sorry, I can't say that, can I? It, it annoyed me greatly. Um, uh, one day I was reading, the, I'm afraid, the Daily Mail. Uh, you may hear some disgusting expressions during this evening, and that's one of them. Um, but, uh, and it said something like, news organisations like the BBC and Sky. And I thought, you idiot, you don't know anything about it. Sky is a small organisation, very, I think, very good. Um, I, I don't mean that to sound patronising. I think it is good and sharp and quick and everything, but it's just a kind of reporting organisation. The BBC is a vast great place. I mean, too big, I often think, but with um, an extraordinary range of high-quality experts whom even I, I've worked for the wretched outfit for 55 years, haven't um, really kind of grasped. I mean, I've now got to know about BBC monitoring uh, and the experts uh, who monitor just about every single country on, on Earth, just their broadcasting, their newspapers and so on. We have extraordinary experts. So I, I thought I'll start up a program which uh, discusses the, the news with people who really know what they're talking about and mostly from the countries uh, involved. So um, what we've been doing that, finishing off today, tonight's programme, it doesn't go out till 11.15 at night on BBC Two, it's already getting a really big audience, so much bigger than the appalling Piers Morgans. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm just waiting, uh, really, to... to uh, it's sort of something like 30, 40 times uh, Piers', Piers audience in Britain, and now it goes out on BBC World and uh, BBC World Service, the radio service. So it's, it's, it gets an audience of, I suppose, already hundreds of millions uh, around the world, which is no, uh, a bit scary, actually. But only somebody like me could keep you waiting so long and then go into a long advertisement for what he's doing, so I apologise. Let's talk about, um, uh, ab uh, about Ukraine. Um, I've, I've not covered really much of the fighting there. I've only... Uh, uh, but I've, I've spent uh, some time there uh, recently. The last time I was there was about three weeks ago, I think three or four weeks ago. So uh, I've, um, you know, I feel myself pretty much up to date. Um, and I've, uh, uh, of course, this programme of mine means that we, on a daily basis, we talk about Ukraine to uh, various of the BBC people there, uh, BBC people in, in Moscow, much, uh, you know, really, really hanging on by their fingernails, as you might imagine. Um, and um, just really kind of studying why it happened, uh, what's going to happen, and what the what the kind of uh, realities uh, and and um, the not so realities of uh, of uh, the, the the whole episode. Um, if I can start by saying that. Um, I, I, well, I, I, let me start with the confession. I mean, it never occurred to me that this would happen. I've met uh, Vladimir Putin various times. I've been really quite impressed by him um, in many, many ways. Uh, he's got a real intellect and a real sharpness of, of mind. Uh, I don't know whether he's ill or not. I mean, you hear all these different stories, but then you hear the stories about all sorts of people. Um, 
uh, Angela Merkel, for instance, you know, well, maybe she did have Parkinson, does have Parkinson's, but you can't tell by watching on television, and you can't tell anything about uh, about uh, Putin's uh, condition just by just by watching uh, watching him. Not at, certainly not at the moment. Um, but he did spend two years uh, under lockdown. He does seem to be excessively nervous about uh, um, uh, catching COVID or catching anything, I suppose. Um, and the number of people that were allowed to see him was always very, very small indeed. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, the, the foreign minister, and his um, uh, Shoigu, his uh, defense minister, and uh, a couple of generals, and not really very many more people than that. And maybe uh, he started, as so often happens, when we sit down on our own and don't have many other people to talk to, he started thinking about his, and in his case, his country's wrongs. And he clearly... Um, it feels what a, a, quite a sizable number of older Russians feel, that uh, what happened after the breakup of the old Soviet Union in 1991 was profoundly wrong. He feels that uh, Ukraine should never have been allowed to break away, and that if, uh, as has happened with Belarusia, that it it did break away, then at least it ought to cling on to uh, the Russian Federation as closely as possible in terms of, of policies and, um, and uh, a general sort of approach. Um, that, of course, Ukraine hasn't done. When you go to Ukraine, it's a very, very big country, and it, it's different from one part of it is different from, from every other part of it, a little bit like the United Kingdom in that sense, except it's far bigger uh, geographically. Uh, but you do get a sense of, of different groupings of people, different um, uh, approaches, different uh, senses of who, they, of who they are. And there are plenty of people that do still think of themselves, if not as, as akin to Russians, at least as, cl as, as being having some sort of closeness with Russia. Many of those people think of that with uh, some distaste now, rather than uh, any kind of, of, uh, of attraction. But you do um, also get people who regard Poland as the kind of place that they naturally would, would gravitate towards. And, uh, and there are other countries too. I mean, uh, the Czech Republic, you find uh, people uh, 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 in the sort of general area of the Czech Republic who, again, see, they don't feel themselves in any sense to be Poles or Czechs or, or indeed Russians, but they do feel um, a certain sense of, of, of kind of kinship. They do understand uh, the way that people on the other side of the border think and act. And um, in the case of a city like, uh, like Lviv, for instance, it just feels entirely like a, a Polish city, a Polish city with Cyrillic writing everywhere. Um, and um, Kiev feels, well, in many ways, it feels kind of, kind of post-Russian. I mean, the buildings look Russian, uh, the people have had a closer relationship with Russia than, uh, than people in the far west uh, of the country had. So I'm just trying to explain to you that it isn't just one thing, one attitude, one approach. Actually, now that we've got the war, uh, it, it does, of course, what wars always do. It brings everybody together around the centre of their of their national uh, feeling. And 
uh, I've, I've spoken to uh, Russian uh, people who would uh, at some stage have regarded themselves as being pretty much Russian and certainly akin to Russian, like the, I don't know what, like the borders of Scotland might see themselves as being quite akin to the people of Northumberland or, 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 or uh, um, you know, the, the, the other board, English border counties closer to them in some ways than they do to people further north, and that certainly is, is the case uh, in, in, uh, in Kiev, except that nobody now can bear the thought, nobody that I met can bear the thought of having anything to do with Russia. Are all those stories about people being found uh, with their hands behind their backs, murdered, uh, tortured, raped, um, are those true? I, I'm afraid they, they are. And uh, I haven't myself, I can't say to you that I've, I've seen these things with my own eyes, but I've talked to really close friends of mine, two, two particular uh, BBC friends of mine who uh, went and did some of the famous uh, reporting on, on what had happened uh, in Bucha and some of the other uh, villages. And there's absolutely no question in my mind that those things really, really did happen. You always, especially if you <laughs> go in for Twitter, you always get people, I, I got a bloke this morning saying, you know, why do you just pump out all this Ukrainian PR bullshit? To, you know, it's, it's, it's all invented by the Americans, you should know better. Well, I know better than that. Uh, I may not have seen it myself, but I've asked the kind of questions that elicit um, the precise uh, uh, answers about the conditions of the bodies and uh, w what, what my colleagues saw. Um, and they're, they're not liars and they're not working for, uh, for anybody else, any other uh, countries or, or, or um, secret services or something, and they're not even particularly attached to to Ukraine. Um, as a you know, whenever you report on something, especially on a country's army, it always uh, irritates the bejesus out of you quite quickly, and you 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 you're not always very positive towards them. But uh, in in these cases, there is absolutely no doubt whatever. Uh, uh, what's happened, and I mean, I've I've reported on Russian troops in other countries. I've reported on what they've done, what they and the Wagner uh, group, which is the sort of mercenary uh, group that, uh, that Russia's called in to, to Ukraine and co has called into Syria and uh, into uh, various African countries now. And I've I've reported on what they what happened in Syria, and I've. I've seen the same, the same things. Uh, sometimes worse, sometimes not so, not so bad. But uh, you know, uh, no doubt uh, in my mind whatsoever, um, what's uh, what's happened and uh, and what's been done. And I mean, the the I've I've seen also uh, less appalling, but still uh, pretty pretty dreadful. I've seen what Russian soldiers do when they find themselves in a, in a town or a city or even a village uh, where people have the kind of things that Russians often don't have out in the, the boondocks in, in, in Russia. Um, and, you know, that I don't have any doubt, for instance, that that um, intercepted uh, phone message from uh, a Russian soldier uh, and his, between a Russian soldier and his mother where she virtually gives him a shopping list. You know, I would like a, one of those iPads and, you know, if you can find a, um, an Apple laptop, uh, I'd like one of those, please. And that, uh, I don't know how commonplace that is, but I didn't have any doubts, and uh, a Russian-speaking uh, expert that we employed uh, said that that was, uh, uh, she felt that was entirely accurate. Um, I don't have any doubt that the, there is looting, as it were, to order, uh, that uh, a lot of, going, uh, of that happening. I haven't been able to see a single Russian soldier, naturally, 
But I mean, all the evidence is that the, their morale is pretty, pretty low. And it is true that quite a few of them uh, were kind of tricked really into uh, going into Ukraine in the first place. They thought they were on a training exercise. And the first thing that they, a lot of them, uh, realized that uh, it wasn't happening was when they came under gunfire for the first time. Will, will the Russians win in the long run? Well, the, I think having failed to capture Kiev in the, in the early stages, in the first couple of days of the war, which indeed, of course, just about every Western country assumed was going to happen. Uh, the, um, the German ambassador in Kiev uh, said, to, um, uh, said to Zelensky, um, we don't think it's worth giving you any weapons because uh, you're going to be out of here in 48 hours and the Russians are going to be in. Um, that was a fairly, uh, fairly representative of what uh, a, lot of, a lot of countries thought. Not in, interestingly, uh, the United States, which had really first-class intelligence. Uh, we've been... I, uh, the, the, there are a couple of, uh, of uh, BBC experts on, on, on intelligence and information. I've been talking to them, and, uh, I mean, they feel that, that there's really somebody either one person or more than one person pretty high up who's uh, well informed and has been all, to, all through the campaign well informed about what Russia was going to do, was planning to do. And the Americans believed it. I thought, I'll be happy to confess it, I thought they're just trying to stir us up uh, to get us to, um, you know, to, to get the British and the French and the Germans to kind of uh, think about what might happen. Uh, it didn't, I don't think it really occurred to me that it would absolutely happen until it actually did start taking place. Um, and uh, I, I think quite a, quite a few people uh, uh, would have agreed with me uh, uh, about that. I, I was talking last night, I went to a, a party where I talked to uh, quite a well-known uh, the figure who used to um, used to be an advisor ages ago to to the prime minister of the day, and um, he said he at, he at first when he was hearing this this stuff uh, he thought yeah it's, uh, it's just the Americans trying to sort of stir things up, uh, and then he made a few calls uh, to friends of his in in Washington and he started to realise that actually they did have first-class sources. And when you think about it, um, the, uh, the Ukrainian government actually uh, went public with uh, some of the uh, information they'd been receiving from uh, inside the, the Kremlin about, for instance, um, uh, the attempt to capture Zelensky early on in the first 24, 48 hours uh, of the attack. They they knew, the Ukrainians knew where to take Zelensky, where to make sure that he wouldn't be captured because they knew who was coming. They had names, apparently, and they had photographs of the teams, people in the teams that were going to be in the, the kind of kidnap squad, the hit squad, whatever you might like to call it. Um, so this isn't... This isn't like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Nazi Germany and, and the Western allies of Britain or whatever in the Second World War. This is very, very different. Russia, a country which I, I spent a lot of time in for the first time I went there, I think it was 1978, and I've been going back and back and back, time and time and time again, and not enough to be able to unfortunately, um, make my Russian any more than really crap. But uh, nevertheless, I, I have spent a, a great deal of time from the, the Brezhnev days right through to, to, to now, really, um, uh, assuming they'll let me back in. Um, and uh, 
You know, it's, it's a, a country that's absolutely shot through with different approaches, differences of opinion. It's not just the kind of one thing that you, you kind of get the impression when you, when you read the, uh, the, the Western press. Um, I mean, we know this, of course, because otherwise, you know, how, how could it be uh, that a, a senior broadcaster, senior news broadcaster, would show up uh, at, at, the, at the back of the studio with a whopping great banner saying whatever it was uh, that it did say, live, on air, uh, constant large numbers of people, I, not probably a huge proportion of the, uh, of, of, of the Russian population, but millions of people really think this is wrong and shouldn't be done, and it's clear that some of those people are very high up indeed. Last night, another person <laughs> that, uh, that I, I uh, uh, had dinner with said uh, that uh, she'd known um, um, Sergei Lavrov, the, the, um, uh, the foreign minister. You know, the man who was quoted everywhere as kind of warning of doomsday and telling us that, that they were going to drop uh, uh, nuclear weapons on us and all of this kind of stuff. Actually... This woman said, uh, Sergei Lavrov is uh, often in tears about what's happening. He can't believe how bad it is and how, how uh, sick he is of, of what's going on. And, you know, we, we, mustn't, uh, we mustn't think that um, it, this is a sort of... So that Russia represents a solid phalanx of hatred for the West. What it does contain, like, like Britain, like so many other countries, is uh, uh, divisions between uh, uh, types of people, between uh, people uh, of, of different um, economic um, and educational bases and, and uh, indeed age groups. And over the uh, people of over 55, 60 tend to watch television uh, and get their news and information from television and state television, which is all there is to watch now, uh, ever since uh, Dodd got uh, got closed down. The the the, um, uh, the state television, of course, only gives one solitary view of what's going on, uh, no matter how many. Uh, brave people try to kind of undermine it and uh, and put out their message, like 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 the uh, uh, like the woman with the with the uh, placard on television. But basically, people just say, "Oh, that kind of thing." They're paid to do it. That's what uh, older people tend to say because they're told that in their in the uh, government newspapers and uh, on, on on government television. Younger people tend to have a very different view. Uh, people under the age of 50, 50, 55 have been able to benefit from the openness of Russia since 1991, uh, and they're much more uh, aware of the outside world and of the fact that, that you know, the state organs um, are, can't be relied on to tell, tell you the truth. So... It's again, again, it's kind of shot through with with differences, different opinions, different attitudes. Um, what's going to happen? Well, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I've made a lifetime out of uh, miscalculating and misunderstanding what's going on, so I'm probably not the right person to to judge it, but. Uh, will, for instance, will um, uh, will Putin, if he's really backed into a corner, will he use nuclear weapons? It's not impossible, but he'd have to be backed very, very far, very deep into a corner. Indeed, his own uh, life, freedom, uh, and his immediate that of those those of his immediate people around him would have to be uh, very, very strongly threatened before he would do it. Would uh, a leading Soviet, uh, leading Russian um, uh, military man or woman 
obey the order to press the button. Actually, we've had at least two occasions, uh, right, dating right back to the Soviet times, when uh, senior officers have refused to do it because they didn't think it was right. It, it's, as I say, you know, don't let's take Russia for granted in the sense of how people respond and so forth. It's not a nation of automata who just do what the boss tells them, even though, of course, as, as in most countries, those, those attitudes do, do, do exist. My feeling is that if, but it is only a feeling, uh, if um, we were kind of close, not, a, not simply to the question of a, an all-out nuclear exchange with the West, I mean, the destruction of everything, uh, but uh, even to the use of, um, of tactical nuclear weapons, m battlefield nuclear weapons, which, which Russian um, uh, uh, military, um, uh, 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 the, the, the way that the Russian military are, are, are taught uh, is actually a, a, a lot sort of kind of easier to take as a step than it is for Western uh, Western soldiers who are taught that once you use local nuclear weapons, the next stage is Armageddon. That isn't the way that R Russian military doctrine has, has, has taught its soldiers up to now. Um, I, I feel that at some stage what will happen is that Putin will get enough territory uh, in the in the east, in the Donbass area, in Hansk and and uh, and that that whole area, um, to be able to say, to come back to people and to to the Russian people and say we've got everything we want, and you know there'll be plenty of people that say, hey, wait a moment, you said you were going to take over the the government in 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 Kiev, but that will kind of just be neatly forgotten about. About There will be, uh, I'm sure, uh, a, a kind of um, a, a, a quite a large strip of territory uh, along from uh, Donbass right through to uh, the, uh, the approaches to Crimea because I'm sure that, uh, that Putin is really anxious to, to kind of, you know, make... make uh, enhance his control over, over Crimea, and he knows that that is something that both Ukraine wants back and that the Western world thinks that ought to be handed back. Um, my guess is that he will, he'll get away with that, uh, that there'll be um, uh, an endless uh, guerrilla war in Donbass uh, and and the the rest of Mariupol and the rest of that line along to uh, to to Crimea and that Ukraine won't simply sit down and accept it even if uh, the uh, Zelensky government feels it's obliged to sign a a, a deal which uh, which kind of gives it away but I'm absolutely certain that uh, there'll be guerrilla movements and a guerrilla low level no doubt. But uh, guerrilla warfare uh, along that uh, that that entire border. So I, I don't. The two things I really wanted to kind of uh, leave with you um, are: don't think that Russia is a, a a kind of block that, with a single attitude and a single approach much, much more complicated than that. And don't think that it's necessarily all going to end appallingly badly. I mean, it will end, it has already ended appallingly badly for tens of thousands of people. And now, you know, as we know, five, six million people have been forced out of their homes by the fighting and so on. I mean, that, that's absolutely appalling. I, I don't know whether anybody else saw this, but I, a, fr a colleague, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, for the BBC uh, did a, 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 a report a couple of days ago about a mother and her two little boys, and they'd all been blinded to one degree of seriousness or another by a missile strike on their, on their home. Uh, you know, 
all that stuff about, believe me, all that stuff about pinpoint accuracy is absolute nonsense. And the, their, their home was the pinpoint uh, uh, um, target of a, of a Russian mi missile. And it, it, it blinded the three of them. And, you know, is anything worth that? Well, I, I don't think so. And it's not worth it, certainly, if it doesn't, doesn't even produce the basic demands that, uh, that Vladimir Putin uh, uh, is making. I personally believe, but I mean, of course, you know, you can believe anything, really, but I personally believe that, that Putin, the beginning of Putin's fall uh, is, is actually uh, happening in front of our eyes, that whenever it happens, could be, it could be years to come before somebody does finally tap him on the shoulder um, and uh, take him out, uh, that uh, this will be the cause of it, the major, major cause of whatever happens. This and, and the events to come that, that, that flow from it. Will we ever see uh, Vladimir Putin behind bars? Will we ever see him... Uh, in at the Hague, uh, uh, pleading uh, uh, presumably not guilty to uh, having committed um, the charges of committing uh, uh, appalling uh, crimes. Um, well, I in nineteen ninety the nineteen nineties from nineteen one and two onwards, I used to spend every summer and every Christmas. Uh, in Sarajevo during the, the, the siege there, which is one of the worst and most shocking things I've ever seen in my life. Um, and I must, I suppose, five years or something I did this, uh, um, spending months at a time. And then people would say, oh, one day um, Milosevic, the, the Serbian leader, will be arrested. Uh, one day um, the, the Bosnian Serb leader will be arrested. Someday, Raklo uh, Mladic will be arrested and will be at The Hague. And then other people say, it's never going to happen. They're never going to let him go. Actually, what, what took place was that there was a coup against uh, Milosevic in Serbia. Uh, a new government took over it wanted to reset its relationship with the outside world, and particularly with the West, and as part of that price, uh, it handed over Milosevic, and then when they were captured, um, um, Mladic and, and uh, Karacic. And I, I'm glad to say I sat in the dock. <laughs> no, I didn't sit in the dock. I sat in the court <laughs> watching the three of them uh, uh, at different times, in the in the dock and being sentenced and I promise you it felt really 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 good so there we are I've raved on for half an hour which is much longer than I should I'm more I'll take any question honestly I don't care you know I'm far too old to care what I say nowadays so well, well thank you very much fascinating stuff I may I kick off and then we'll pass the, I'll bring the microphone to other questioners but uh, uh, I'm impressed by a BBC correspondent who I think is called Jenny in Moscow. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, I had two, two queries about that situation. To what degree, if any, do you think she and others are uh, at all muzzled by the situation in which they find themselves? To what degree can they actually tell, tell it as it is? Um, and secondly, today she was saying at lunchtime that she'd been in conversation with um, a number of quite senior people, with, with other um, journalists, and they had asked the question, uh, does Vladimir Putin regret what he has done? And the answer that they were given was yes. Mm. Mm. Um, let me d d deal with the second part first. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sure. I mean... You know, to be a, a sentient, and as I was saying earlier, I mean, a really clever person, of course he knows that it's screwed up. Uh, of course he knows that that idea that you can just move in 
to a city like Kiev, which was so actually so close to the to the border, um, and and fail to capture Zelensky and the people around him. I mean, he he knew within two days that the whole thing was going to go wrong, and of course he must he must regret it. Yes, he is not a kind of mad dictator, no matter what the Daily Mail. <laughs> says says about him and he yes he must know that and he must be trying to work out what the hell to do now how to get out of it and i think the only answer is as i was really saying to let it go on for a bit let everybody get used to it a lot of people uh, are going to die and be injured uh, but uh, after a while then it'll be possible to say, oh, you know, we can be magnanimous. We've won so much. We can now start thinking about a deal. That's him. Uh, the um, the uh, people, I, uh, actually, I don't, I don't know that particular correspondent, but I do know Steve Rosenberg, who's been the BBC correspondent in Moscow. He's now the BBC editor in, in Moscow. These things matter to people like me. Um, uh, he uh, has lived, I think I'm right in saying, 33, 34 years of his life in Russia. He's m married to a Russian woman. He's, ki he's bringing his kids up effectively as Russians with, with you know, with a British passport. Steve uh, is somebody who's deeply, deeply imbued with, with Russia and its culture and its political culture as well. And, um, I mean, a, a, a sadder person at the moment would be hard to find when the country that you absolutely adore is doing something that you believe is utterly, utterly wrong. Imagine what that must feel like. Now, I, I, as I say, I haven't, I haven't spoken to her, but I, I've, I've spoken at some length to Steve. And I've been in, in that kind of situation myself. I was the BBC correspondent uh, in uh, South Africa during the height of apartheid, uh, 1970, when was that? 76 to 8, I think it was. Um, you can't, under those circumstances, say everything you want to say. But then you can't anyway, really. I mean, because not enough of it is is factually is sufficiently factually based for you to be able to say with confidence yes i can tell you this that and the other has has happened you can say i believe it may be happening so he's in a very he and she are in a very very tricky position one word one solitary word that offends the, the Russian government, and they'll be out. But at the same time, um, and I remember this from my day, and of course I've, I've done a lot of reporting from Russia where the, the same thing applied, except not so seriously to, to, to those two. Um, I, I just remember uh, the, the head of BBC News saying to me before I went to South Africa, look, there are going to be loads and loads and loads of stories which are going to get up the noses of the of the authorities, but you know which you can report without getting chucked out. Uh, and he said, "I don't want to hear you telling me that you got chucked out because you used a, a word like I don't know extremist or or Nazi. I mean, God, any comparison of what uh, a Putin is doing in in Russia at the moment, and the people that support him, even though the the uh, uh, wretched um, uh, um, Wagner Brigade are, you know, thoroughly a lot of. I mean, the last time I saw anybody from the uh, the the uh, the brigade, he had a, a swastika tattooed on his forehead. I mean, you don't do that unless you're fairly confident of the of the cause that you support. That was in Crimea some years ago. Um, but um, y you know. You can go. You can hint at so much. You can give so much of an impression without actually using the trigger words that mean they're going to come round and, and put you on a plane forcibly for home. Great question. Thank you. Two two questions. Firstly, is Zelensky the real deal? 
And second, which you may have answered just yes or no. And the second is, is Odessa safe in the long term? Because that's a crucial area. For absolutely, Ukraine. absolutely. Um, Zelensky, I've, I've not met him. Uh, and, you know, you, you need to meet somebody to get a real impression. I think, uh, I think it, well, he's an actor. He's an actor who, if you remember, played the part of Ukraine's president in a, in a long-running television show. I must say, when he was put up for the, for the um, presidency and then elected, I thought this is kind of a downward spiral, finally, into absurdity. Uh, you know, how wrong, again? Because he knows how, how, what he ought to do to, how much that is genuine and how much it's his kind of theatrical training, I don't know. I really, really don't know. I, you know, did when, when uh, Churchill was talking about blood, sweat and tears, I mean, did he, did he actually mean it? Who knows? Who knows? But, you know, it, 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 it worked out well for him and it's working out well for, for Zelensky at the moment. Um, so... I, all I can say is, um, you know, I, I don't know, but he looks okay, and looks are, are so much in our modern world. Will, um, will Odessa fall? I don't think so. I think it'll take a terrible hammering, but, you know, the Russians haven't got the control of the sea that they need to have in order to blast uh, Odessa and the other ports and uh, uh, along the way. So I think... I, I don't know if you've ever been there. I mean, a wonderfully beautiful, lovely kind of uh, uh, czarist uh, uh, architecture and so on. And, you know, I, I think we've got to resign ourselves to the thought that it's going to be pretty much smashed up. But I don't think they'll actually capture it. Good. Thank you. Any... And there's one over here. Would anyone else sort of... Yeah, I'll come to you. Let's have a quick fire of questions, shall we? Right. The uh, question is about moral authority. Uh, my son tends to challenge me on this and says, well, if you are uh, a bystander in this, not part of, the, say, the Western Alliance, uh, then one would look at the unauthorised invasion of Iraq, for example, uh, and earlier on, for example, in a different context, uh, preaching to the Chinese about how they should behave. One has to remember they have long memories and there were opium wars. So I, 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 I struggle a bit to defend uh, unequivocally the moral authority of the West in this situation. I would like some help. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right, and it's, a, it's an, an appallingly weak point uh, that uh, a country like, like Britain, which uh, went along with, a, as you say, an unauthorised uh, attack on, well, unauthorised at any rate, by the, by the United Nations, attack on, the, uh, on Iraq and... Uh, uh, carried through regime change, um, American soldiers. I mean, I was I spent so much of my time in in Iraq from 2003 through to about 2012. Um, you know, talking to people who had been tortured by by the Americans. I mean, absolutely shameful and appalling. Um, I think there may be a limit uh, to how far back. You go. I mean, I, you know, uh, I think the opium wars, though disgusting, um, are, you know, I, not even I remember the opium wars. Uh, I think that is a little bit, a little bit bad. But I mean, let's not say the Chinese government doesn't, uh, you know, think about it and mention it. Uh, believe me, uh, mention it, mentions it fairly, fairly often when I go to, to go to Beijing. But I don't feel, I don't feel. Uh, uh, you know, quite as uh, as strongly as I do about Iraq, because I saw Iraq, I watched it go through. I don't feel um, uh, uh, the, the the equivalent is true, in fact, of Afghanistan. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, it was a, a major foul up uh, and uh, not exactly um, uh, uh, a success in the long run. Let's face it. Um, I just uh, I just think that. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, accusing you of this, although, of course, on Twitter, I'm always accusing people of it. But I, the, the sort of whataboutism, I don't think that is uh, a reasonable 
judgment of what's happening on a daily and hourly basis in Ukraine. I don't think anything could conceivably justify it. And although the Americans killed an awful lot of civilians and used weapons that I don't believe they should have used against, against uh, civilians as well as, uh, as, well as uh, the military and, um, the, uh, you know, and, and tortured their prisoners in a way that I, I never thought to see a, a Western uh, government do and boast about and talk about openly. Um, I just, I just don't think that any of that justifies. Well, for instance, that picture I was telling you about of of the the woman and her two blinded sons. Nothing, nothing justifies that. A couple of, yeah. Um, yeah. So just on that last point you were saying, how do you cope in conflict uh, in conflict zones when you see so many dramatic and devastating things? What uh, you mean, seeing these kind of things? Yeah, and then reporting them also faithfully. Well, uh, actually, I, I would say that the reporting about them is is the 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 kind of therapy. It's I think it's when you see these things and they boil up in you, and you can't when you come home. I'm really thinking about soldiers, uh, particularly. You you can't tell your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your son, your daughter about what you've seen because you, you know the effect that it'll have on them. You don't want to hurt them that much. Uh, I, I've, I mean, I, let me give you an example. Um, I, I was in Afghanistan, and I can't think when it was, uh, just before the Taliban took over the first time, so about 95, something like that. And um, for some uh, completely bonkers reason they the uh, government the mujahideen government decided to show how tough it was and uh, there was a really nasty case of a family wiped out by three criminals and they they uh, hanged the three criminals they hung them up and um, they they screwed it up Royally, I mean, I, you know, uh, they, they, it was awful for every, every one of the three died un, under circumstances you wouldn't want to do. And I had to watch all this. And um, I, I, I had to write something about it afterwards. I mean, I did a report on it for the BBC, but, you know, the BBC was so kind of uh, nervous about showing anything. We weren't allowed to show... I don't think we're allowed to show the rope in the end. I can't remember, you know. I mean, it's not called auntie for nothing, believe me. Um, but uh, then I, I, uh, I, I, in those days, I used to write uh, quite a lot of newspaper articles. I wrote an article about it, a big article. And again, in those days, uh, you, you had to dictate it to a, 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 a... It was always a lady, and she was always sitting there. Well, this was... a the Sunday Telegraph, so of course, you know, she would be a lady. And um, she, uh, uh, and at the end of it, she said to me, you poor thing, to have had to look at that and to, to go through that. And, but I, I thought, I felt that by writing about it, by broadcasting about it, by talking about it, it, it didn't have an effect. And at the time, when I saw the three bodies lying, hanging there, I thought, this is going to stay with me for the rest of my life. I'm going to wake up every bloody night uh, until I die thinking about this. And indeed, the first night, I, I, I did. Uh, that's exactly what happened. I woke up and I couldn't get back to sleep again. I just seeing the whole thing over and over again in my mind. But then I wrote the article. And after that, um, you know, it doesn't... I, I, I think about it sometimes, but it doesn't... It hasn't... Control, it doesn't control me. I, I feel that by writing about it, uh, by broadcasting about these things, by even by talking about these things now, you start to control it. So, uh, you know, it's quite sort of fashionable for... Uh, ancient correspondents to suddenly discover that they've got PTSD. Well, I, I, I haven't. I mean, I, it, probably because I'm far too insensitive and, uh, and, and crude. But um, 
it hasn't it hasn't affected me i'm glad to say okay, we've got time for three more questions one is here and then i can see a line going over there um uh, do you want to take the three at once or do you want no no to, no uh, one after the other I'll try, I'll try not to rat I might rattle on like naughtily ask two but they can be very quick answers okay. um the first being you mentioned at the start of the conflict in ukraine you sort of had this idea of what Germany's position was in some of European countries and what the US position was. I was wondering if you could enlighten us a bit more on the UK position. Yeah, um, it, the thing is that there's a very close relationship in, in uh, intelligence terms, as you know, between America and Britain. So everything that the Americans got from whatever source or sources it did were passed on as i understand it very quickly to the to the british and so they they started saying the same kind of things i i i noticed you know it's going to happen it's actually it's real it's going to happen and again i'm afraid i i said yeah 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 right they're just saying what the americans are telling them to say um and i was i was uh, completely wrong but um the, so the British government, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, believed it. Where what's happening within the British government, and these are pretty early days, is a, 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 a lack of agreement about where we're where we're going. Liz Truss, the the foreign secretary, says that uh, uh, Russia must be thrown back to the point where it's got to give up uh, control over Crimea. I, I find that impossible to 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 believe. Uh, it's too important to Russia and Russians for them ever to to do that. Whereas uh, Ben, what's his name, Wallace, the the defence minister, is much more sort of this is going to uh, inclined to say this is going to go on for a very long time. Uh, we don't know. It, I think he's the one that said uh, echoed the Zelensky line, which is actually much less strong than the British or American lines, um, Russia must just go back to the, to the day before the invasion. So, you know, the, all these things kind of coming up and uh, not, nothing settled. Yeah. The second thing was just about, um, we spoke a bit about Donbass, and I was wondering, we've sort of seen a lot of the War of the Land, um, and we've seen a small amount, certainly personally, I've not seen all that much about the War of the Sea. Mm. Um, and we saw this missile strike from the Exocet um, on a Russian ship. And I wonder sort of what you foresee for the sea around there. You know, is there, is there any well, chance of like a, a lot more water-based warfare? No, I think on the contrary. I think, I think the Russian Navy has been really scared by what happened, losing its, its biggest ship there. Um, and, uh, and and apparently losing another another vessel fairly recently, um, and that in turn means I don't think. I mean, I'm, I'm, what am I? I'm, I'm I, you know I'm just a journalist. I'm not a military expert, but I can't see how uh, Russia could stage a, a major attack on Transnistria, which is that thin element to the west of Odessa, which actually belongs to Moldova, but has a Russian-speaking majority. I, you know, uh, the, there was a Russian general recently who was saying, that's our next, uh, our next uh, aim is to go there. I can't see how they can do that without having naval supremacy. And they don't. They really don't. So I think that's an important, uh, hugely important element. It doesn't mean that they can't mop up the uh, the various ports along the the coast uh, towards Crimea, but not, I would say, as far as uh, as Odessa. So, um, you beat me to Moscow by two years. Um, I've spent some time in Ukraine, and also in East Europe in general. Um, we've got friends in Kiev, and my family's organised visas for. Uh, a family in uh, Kiev. They've chosen to stay for the moment because it seems relatively safe. But let me take you to, to another point. If you look on the BBC website and type in NATO, there are a couple of maps 
one shows NATO in 1997, mm -hmm. and one shows NATO now. Now, if I'm looking at that from Moscow, I would see that as a threat. I cannot see why NATO would want to expand in that way if it was not to propose an apparent, if not a real, threat to, to, uh, the Soviet, to, to Russia. I, I think there's two elements to that. One is that there undoubtedly was, after 1991, a desire uh, on the part of various senior people in Washington uh, to rub Russia's nose in it and to say, this is, it, we clearly won this war and you lost it. Uh, that I, I, you know, that was quite a commonplace in Washington uh, in the early 90s. Um, and uh, the British government, for instance, uh, wasn't at all in, in favour of taking that attitude and wanted to, to hold out a hand of friendship more than the Americans did to Russia. But you've got to recall that every one of those countries that's joined NATO and which is indeed heading right close to the, to the Russian border, every single one of those countries begged to be allowed to join NATO because so many of them had suffered from Russian, the brutality that Russia has shown, Poland, uh, the, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, uh, East Germany, um, uh, every, every single one of those countries um, suffered from Russian invasion. The uh, Baltic states, all terrified that Russia was going to use the, the population, sometimes small, sometimes larger, of Russian speakers in the Baltic states to bring, grab them and bring them back to greater Russia. It isn't, you know, sometimes it's presented as, as uh, the, 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 the Americans in particular being absolutely determined to, to uh, um, go right up to the borders of Russia and control them. In fact, uh, the, the real effort came from the countries which wanted to be protected from Russia, which we're now seeing with Sweden and Finland. Nobody forced them to do anything of the sort, any, any joining of NATO, any, any giving up of their, uh, of, of their neutrality. But the spokeswoman of the Russian um, uh, ministry said, we warn... Uh, actually, before there was any indication that, that, that Finland and, and, uh, and, and Sweden might want to join NATO, she said... We warn those countries that if they join NATO, there will be military consequences. So what do you do when another government says, you know, we're telling you what you can do? It's natural, it's raining, they want to come in under the umbrella. So I don't think, uh, although, I, you know, I think you're right that there was a, a, a desire early on uh, it, 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 with the Americans. I, I think that had faded out by the, by the late 90s and into the new century. Final question. So the Azov Battalion appears to have played a large role in the Ukrainian defence and has in the past some quite notable human rights abuses. Also, as far as I can make out, it has had a relationship with several of the previous Ukrainian governments. Therefore, if and when the war ends, how do you see that relationship sort of growing, if you like, and structurally, what would their role be and how would that affect Western relationships with Ukraine? Well, I, I don't know how deliberate it is. Um, and it may just be chance, but the uh, Azov Brigade has been sucked into the defence of Mariupol to the extent that uh, I, I doubt if there'll be much left of it uh, when, when Mariupol finally falls, when the, the um, um, Azovstal, uh, that huge 
uh, complex, which is still, as, I mean, as we're talking, there's still fighting going on there in the tunnels underneath it and, uh, and so forth. And much of the fighting is being done by members of the Azov Brigade. I mean, Zelensky himself, uh, uh, by all accounts, knows what an embarrassment the Azov Brigade is. Uh, he um, took the, the, the opportunity when, after the Russian invasion, of uh, drawing it into the Ukrainian armed forces. I mean, before that, it was just a kind of gang of thugs, uh, not totally unlike uh, the... Um, the, the ones that the, the Russians use, the Wagner group. Um, and uh, it, he, he brought it in, and whether he did it or whether somebody else did it, I don't know, but gave it new, uh, new senior officers and uh, integrated it into the, into the army. A little bit like, I don't know what, uh, you know, the um, Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, the... Uh, uh, the UDA was brought in to the uh, to, 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 to the regiment, which uh, uh, you know was one of the defenders of of, of Northern Ireland uh, in the in the in the seventies and eighties. That was part of the deal, and by having them inside rather than outside, you do you do kind of control them. You can't stop you can't stop what they think but you can stop them doing, uh, taking any action on it. So my guess is that there won't be an awful lot of the Azov Brigade uh, coming out of, uh, of Mariupol alive and, and active, and those that, that are, will be, I'm sure, will just be kind of spread around. It is not, I, I, I have to emphasise this, there are, of course, um, uh, neo-Nazis uh, in Ukraine, but then there are in Russia... Uh, there are people with all sorts of distasteful opinions uh, about, well, Jews, like Jews like Zelensky. Um, but, uh, you know, there are in this country. There are everywhere. It's not, it's not what they think that matters. It's what they do if they're organised that matters. And my guess is that the Azov Brigade will actually pretty much cease to exist. Well, it was a really uh, fascinating hour, uh, and uh, we very much appreciate it. I'm full of admiration, not only for your um, tour de force kind of presentation, <laughs> but your energy and being in London all day, getting here, oh. and then standing up. Well, um, I'm very... Unscripted for an hour is, is, is well, well done. My tour de France. Indeed. I'm delighted to say that there will be uh, refreshments, wine and soft drinks in the vestibule uh, right now, to which you're all welcome.